What's going on guys, Flyby Simulations here and welcome to the second episode in my Aircraft Dissected series, wherein we delve into every single switch, knob and display in the flight deck of the Airbus A320 family to give you guys an in-depth understanding of every system present within the aircraft. Now, in the previous episode, we took a look at the left-hand column of the lower overhead panel in the flight deck, and in this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the central column. Firstly, I highly encourage you guys to watch the first episode in this series if you haven't seen it yet, as these videos are meant to build upon each other, especially as we move further into the series. Hence, it would be highly advantageous for you guys as viewers to watch them in order. Secondly, I must say that I am not a real-world pilot. I am a 22-year-old business analytics and marketing university student with a keen passion for aviation and aerospace. Now, long-term viewers of the channel might know that I'm not much of a bush pilot or GA aircraft flyer. I love flying large airliners, which usually involves long periods of time where I put the plane on cruise and just kind of sit there. So instead of rotting in front of my monitor for hours on end, I prefer to go out and do things, whether it may be a run, doing my laundry, enjoying a meal outside, but there's always that lingering feeling about how my flight is doing, whether it's all peaceful or if I'm in an uncontrolled nosedive about to kill all of my passengers. Well, with today's sponsor, Asun Remote, you don't have to worry anymore. Asun is a free-to-download application software from macOS, Windows, and Android that allows you to remotely control your PC using your phone. As can be seen here, I can monitor my flight, control the cameras, and even move things around as needed without having to be anywhere near my monitor. And this doesn't just work for games. As a content creator, I get great peace of mind when I can monitor the status of my video being rendered on my editing software and having the ability to upload videos to YouTube without physically being at my desk or computer is an absolute godsend. The app does allow keyboard customization as well as mouse support and can also support games up to 144 FPS. So log on to the link in the description section of the video to see all of their expanded payment plans, including a pluggable device that can wake up your PC remotely. Once again, that's Awesome Remote, and you can find out more by clicking on the link in the description section of the video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the flight deck of the Airbus A320 and specifically to the lower overhead panel. So continuing from this previous episode where we covered this part of the panel, as mentioned before in this video, we will go ahead and cover this column. All right, so coming underneath, we have the anti-ice panel, which, as the name implies, is responsible for preventing ice from building up in and on crucial areas of the aircraft's frame. On the left here, we have the wing anti-ice switch. The three outboard slats on each wing have pneumatic bleed air valves inside of them, which can supply hot bleed air to prevent icing on the wing. When no light is illuminated, the wing anti-ice is turned off. An on light is illuminated when pilots manually turn the anti-ice system on, and a fault light implies a fault with the wing anti-ice system. Coming further right, we also have two engine anti-ice switches. Again, hot bleed air is circulated around each engine nacelle to avoid icing within the engines. The switch and the indications on it work identically to the wing anti-ice switch. Finally, we also have a probe slash window heat switch here. This system is responsible for electrically heating up sensitive equipment on the outside of the aircraft such as pitot tubes and guided alpha vanes that are responsible for calculating precise measurements such as the aircraft's speed, altitude, heading, and so on. Additionally, the system also electrically heats up the flight deck windows to prevent icing or fogging. When no light is illuminated, the system is running in the auto configuration, but pilots can also manually turn the system on if they please. So to the right of the anti-ice panel, we have the cabin pressurization control panel. Now it's important to understand that before every flight, after the doors are locked and sealed, the aircraft is pressurized internally in order to maintain a certain cabin pressure throughout the flight. This is based upon several factors such as the aircraft's planned cruising altitude, as well as the altitude of the nearby terrain and the local airport. However, the pressure is always kept below that of what you will find the atmospheric pressure to be below 10,000 feet. This is because at higher altitudes, the atmospheric pressure decreases, thereby disallowing human beings from inhaling oxygen present in the air, leading to hypoxia and permanent brain damage and even to death. 
In a situation like this, the pilots will initiate an emergency descent to below 10,000 feet. If you would like to see an excellent dramatization of this actually happening in real life, check out the story of Qantas Flight 30 that I covered in this video right here. It's an awe-inspiring story wherein the cabin of a Boeing 747 aircraft depressurized at 39,000 feet, forcing the pilots to perform an emergency descent. So coming to the panel itself, the pressurization system within the aircraft is controlled automatically during normal operations. However, in the event of an emergency, pilots can push this mode select button to switch to manual mode. This will allow pilots to operate a manual vertical speed control switch, which is a spring-loaded switch that regulates the flow of air into the cabin to maintain a stable cabin pressure during the emergency descent. Coming further right here, we have the landing elevation selector, which allows pilots to manually select the elevation of the arrival airport to prepare the pressurization system if the airport is situated at a high altitude. The selector is normally left to this middle auto position. Finally, here we have this guarded ditching switch, which when turned on, will close all emergency pressurization valves and seal any open valves and ducts on the exterior of the aircraft in the event that pilots have to perform an emergency water landing or for de-icing operations. Now I'm sure you've... Now I'm sure you've all heard of the famous United Flight 1549 Miracle on the Hudson, where Captain Sullenberger had to land an A320 in the Hudson River in New Jersey after a bird strike incident. Now, due to the commotion after landing, the first officer didn't have time to actually press the switch, which severely sped up the rate at which water began entering the cabin after a successful emergency landing into the Hudson. Just goes to show how important every little switch and subsystem can be when it's called upon. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, with all that done, we now only have the interior and exterior lighting panels and the passenger signs panel to look at. These videos do take a lot of effort and time to put together, so if you guys wish to support me and help me to continue making more of these, then please subscribe to the channel. Also consider joining our free Discord community if you have any questions, and give this video a like to let YouTube know you're enjoying what you're seeing. Additionally, and this is in no way necessary, you can also feel free to join our exclusive Patreon page to help support the series financially. Just as an added measure of gratitude for your support, I will also be providing the written text version of these videos for those of you who want to read the series like a book over on my Patreon page, along with other exclusive benefits, giveaways, and more in the future. Once again, that's completely optional. So let's start with the external lighting control panel on the left. First up here, we have the strobe light switch. The strobe lights are located on each wingtip and below the APU tail cone. Turning the switch on obviously illuminates the strobe lights and turning it off will switch off the strobe lights. When switching to the middle auto position, the lights will automatically illuminate when the main gear shock absorbers are not compressed, basically meaning that when the aircraft is in the air. Pilots normally turn on the strobe lights when entering the runway and turn it off once they have vacated the runway. Coming to the aircraft, we have the beacon light switch, which is a red rotating anti-collision light mounted on both the top and bottom of the fuselage. Pilots will turn this light on before starting the engines at the departure airport and only turn it off after shutting down both engines at the arrival airport. The purpose of these lights is to alert any ground crew working near the aircraft that the engines are about to be started, and they should therefore steer clear of the aircraft. To the right of this switch, we have the wing light switch, which is located in front of the leading edge of each wing on either side of the fuselage, and they illuminate the wing leading edge and engine nacelle. Pilots will often turn on this light while performing their external walk around to check for wing or engine damage, and certain airlines also turn the wing lights on during takeoff and landing. To the right of this switch, we have the nav and logo light. This light has three positions, off, one, and two. Off obviously turns all lights off. When switched to the one position, the forward position nav lights are activated, which is a set of two lights. The light illuminates green on the right wing and red on the left wing, and is designed to instruct ground crew that pilots are indeed working in the aircraft. Additionally, it also helps other pilots on the ground see if the aircraft is approaching them or moving away from them in poor visibility conditions while taxiing on the ground. Position 2 arms the aft position navigation lights as well as the logo light. Coming to the bottom row, we have the runway turnoff lights, which are mounted on nose gear struts and shine a bright straight light at an angle from the front to illuminate the aircraft's peripherals. 
To the right, we have two landing light switches which are placed inside the belly of the aircraft when in the retract position. When switched to the off position, these lights are extended out from underneath the aircraft but still remain off. Finally, the on position turns these bright lights on. Pilots turn these lights on during takeoff and only turn them off when passing 10,000 feet during their climb. They will turn these lights on again when approaching 10,000 feet during descent and will only turn them off after having vacated the runway at the arrival airport. Finally, we also have the nose light here which shines a straight beam of light in front of the aircraft and is mounted on the nose landing gear. When switched to the taxi position, the light is illuminated dimly to allow pilots to taxi around the airport. Finally, the switch may also be moved to the TO or takeoff position during takeoff for a brighter beam of light. Alright guys, finally here we have the integral and cabin signs lighting control panel. So again, starting from the left, we have the overhead integral lighting knob, which controls the backlighting of the buttons and switches on the overhead panel. To the right of this knob, we have the ice indicator and standby compass light, which, as the name suggests, illuminates this ice indicator and standby compass display when turned on. Moving further right, we have this dome light switch, which illuminates these two large lights beside the overhead panel to illuminate the entire cockpit. It can be cycled between the off, dim, and bright modes. Finally, on this row, we have the annunciator light switch, which when switched to this test position, will illuminate all the bulbs in the flight deck to allow pilots to check if all lights and indications are working as intended. The dim and bright modes simply help adjust the regular brightness of these lights in the flight deck. Coming down to the passenger signs row, on the left we have the famous seatbelt signs button which is turned on after fueling has been finished prior to takeoff. It is then turned off during cruise and again turned on prior to descent. To the right of this switch we have the no smoking switch which has an on, off and auto position which are again self explanatory. Finally to the right here we have the emergency exit light switch which illuminates the emergency light strips in the cabin. When set to the armed position, the lights will automatically illuminate in the event of an emergency, and the on and off positions are again self-explanatory. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the exploration of the central column on the lower overhead panel on the Airbus A320. If you made it this far, congratulations. You now have a sound understanding about every major system on this aircraft and are now aware of the functionality of practically every knob, switch, alarm, and light above the pilots in the flight deck. Now, I must also mention that all of the documentation and websites I used to research for this video are linked down below in the description section of the video, and a written text version of this video can be found exclusively on my Patreon page if you prefer to read that and understand more about this aircraft. That being said, the next video in the series will focus on the right column of the lower overhead panel as well as the entirety of the aft overhead panel which houses some emergency equipment and switches. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure to perform a full stop landing at the like button and the subscribe button and press the bell icon for future notifications from this channel. Also, be sure to fly by the comment section and let me know if there's any questions you'd like me to answer for you. As usual, thanks for watching and thanks for flying by.